Okay, good evening, everyone. It is now six o'clock here at the ATL Comets Convention. This panel is the Father Fathers Know Worst, or Fathers Knows Worst, or however I put it in the program. <laughs> um, coming from someone who taught ELA for a couple of years. Um, this panel is about the fandom fathers. They've influenced many of our favorite characters from Bruce Wayne to John Winchester. Did they do right by their kids or screw them up beyond belief? The results speak for themselves. I will um, give my panelists a chance to introduce themselves. We will start on the end, the other hand. Are you ready? <laughs> really? I can kick you out. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here on a Friday night. My name is Darren Bush. I am also sometimes known as the professor. I'm from here in Atlanta. I help run a bunch of Atlanta science fiction fantasy conventions. I work at Dragon Con. You might have heard of it. I'm not quite as big as this place, but it's working on it. I'm also allowed to say I'm an award-winning science fiction and fantasy short story author, blah, 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 blah. And also recently started a company called Tables of Content. I have some QR codes up here. We're trying to be a science fiction convention, science fiction literature convention. Um, but currently, it's just a YouTube channel with a bunch of my buddies talking about science fiction and fantasy movies. Sorry. Hey, guys. My name is Michael Collins. I am the theory prognosticator and dad joke enthusiast for the Fandom Hybrid podcast. Um, and Hanukkah will tell you more about that. This is my second year at Atlanta Comic Con. I am... Lean, I am almost, Hanukkah has almost convinced me to start watching Walking Dead because we've known each other forever, but it's, it's, I'm close, but I'm not there yet. Hi, my name is Hanukkah Ricks. I am the creator and host of the Phantom Hybrid Podcast. We are a pop culture podcast. We uh, basically discuss and recap uh, various TV shows, films, mostly in the fantasy and superhero genre, but we also touch on some other things every once in a while. Um, this is my second year here at ATL Comic Convention as a panelist, but I have been a panelist on the Atlanta convention scene for the last 13 years, uh, mostly at Dragon Con. I also do Conjuration, and uh, last year we did Nerdy Gras and one, uh, oh, Monsterama. Monster so, um, yeah, this is fun. I, I, I like to talk about geek stuff, so thank you for coming. Hello, um, again, my name is Anthony Liggins. I am a co-host of the Phantom Hybrid Podcast. I also used to be a video game reviewer for blogcritics.com. I was also the assistant director of media at Monsterama Con, working for Darren down there on the end. Um, and this panel came about because I was reading a, Bruce, a Batman comic book and I thought, Bruce Wayne is a terrible dad. Like, he's absolute worst father. We should do a panel on bad fathers. So why is Bruce Wayne the terrible father? Because um, he shops for kids at all ages. That, amongst other things. But um, actually, I'm just going to skip to the chase. I found out and I finally realized that it's Alfred Pennyworth was actually a problem. Because he had this eight-year-old kid who had both watched his parents murder. And instead of giving him help, he taught him to deal with his grief through violence. And what did Bruce Wayne do with the first kid he adopted? He taught him how to deal with his grief through violence. And the second kid through violence. The third kid through violence. All of this is because of Alfred. So I'm not blaming Bruce as much as I did. Um, today I watched The Batman again, and there's a scene where... Um, Alfred, is, after he's hurt, he's laying in bed, and he tells Bruce, I have failed you. You needed a father. I was not equipped to do that. No, you were not. <laughs> you were not. And that's why Bruce is where he is, and that's why all his kids are violent people. Okay, they do good, but yeah, they all need help, and they haven't gotten any, and Bruce needs help. So um, I want to kick this off by saying that this is an open discussion. So we're going to talk about some of the ones we want to talk about, and then I'll open it up to the floor. Remember, everyone's opinion is valid. Please respect each other. And also, we're not going to therapy these parents one way or another. We're just not going to do it. We, we, we'll probably try a little bit, but Bruce, we don't have time. 
Yeah. Someone has to. <laughs> yeah, we may have to. Really but know. I'm going to go first because I like oh, to talk oh, a lot. Mr. And Mr. I want to get it out the way. Yes, Darren. <laughs> can, can I ask everybody a question before we get started? Yes. How many fathers in the room? Okay, good. All right. Just want to get that out of the way. Oh, my bad. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, know where you were, I didn't know where you were going with it. <laughs> so I didn't want to admit to something and then get... Your wife is right there, <laughs> sir. <laughs> if they don't know that. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you are a father, do not take offense. I won't take offense. Um, I wanted to start off with Vernon Dursley from Harry Potter. How many of you read Harry Potter books? Probably most of us. Okay, so we do trivia and one, one trivia night at Betsy and Brewery. Um, on Tuesdays, if you need the schedule, I think Hanukkah has a schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hanukkah has a schedule. Anyway, we had to read. Well, one trivia was um, what was the last one? Order of the Order Phoenix. Phoenix. And so I was like, well, I'm going to reread this book. So I'm reading the book, and I remember the Dursleys are terrible. They're the absolute worst parents. Vernon Dursley is horrible. He's like very enabling to Dudley. Dudley. Very enabling, and and I, I I'm at a loss of words. I was talking to Hanukkah about it. I'm like, I can't believe that Harry turned out to be as decent as he is <laughs> because of how he was raised. You realize they raised him from a baby, from an infant, and this is the only family he knows. Vernon is the only father figure he's ever had, and he sticks him in a cabinet, basically a closet. And that's his room. Mm -hmm. He gets hand-me-down clothes. He doesn't go out. He can't get regular food. He has to eat scraps. It's, he gets stuff like a clothes hanger for Christmas or used tissue. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Vernon is the worst. And you know, I, I don't know if anyone else has any opinions on it. I just wanted to get that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> I think what was that? Well, no, if, if that was if that was true, if that was true. He would have been better off. Yeah, they hated him. Yeah, they hated him enough that they were him. like, "Let's like, put you in a closet." Yeah, and and there's a there's a great theory that I, I wish I thought of this. Um, one of the people at Conjuration was telling me that the idea is that it's actually not the Dursleys' fault entirely because they did not know that for all of those years they were living with a Horcrux. Yeah, I saw that as well. Right? Yeah, I saw okay. that. There we go. I, I heard that. I think, I think yeah. we didn't. We not talk about that. It took I think me, we did. We might have mentioned it. Before, we may have mentioned right? it. Where it took, it took it's me a month possible. to process that. Yeah. So, um, we saw how quickly it changed Ron's whole personality. Mm -hmm. When he was carrying the anger, he was the most angry person in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he was the most No, I I would mm -mm. I would disagree with that because if you look at the memories of Petunia with her sister and uh, the way that they spoke about Lily and James about Sirius, that was way before Harry was in there. Uh, that was even before Harry was born. So I don't think that that may have amplified their yeah. feelings towards him yeah. on top of the animosity that they felt because now they have to take care of this magical child when they both were so against magic, you know, so you have that animosity on top of it. And I think maybe Harry, amplify that but no that yeah. that ugliness that hate that was in them that was in them long before harry was even a thought in their parents mind in his parents mind so yeah no. yeah i would i would say that the horcrux made ron more of the worst parts of being Ron. yes it didn't invent anything in ron's personality it just blew out of proportion the worst bits mm -hmm. like it did with everybody else but yeah the the, the dursleys hated that child before the horcrux thing came along mm -hmm. Yeah, and not, not as much as maybe the Horcrux caused. And we will discuss, Petun I will discuss Petunia tomorrow, 6 o'clock, same room, mothers aren't better. Because I have a lot of things to say about her as well. But yes, in the flashbacks, she's, she was already terrible towards her sister and Sirius, how she felt about it in the flashbacks. But see, so, the, the, the difference with, with Petunia and Vernon is that Petunia... Her reasoning was that she was jealous of her sister because she wanted to be magical mm -hmm. and she had no magical ability and she was upset for that. So she basically took her anger out on her sister and by extension her child. Vernon was just a dick to begin yes. with. 
So I, I'm sorry. I know it's like a six o'clock panel, but I mean, it, it's it's. <laughs> I, I can't think of a nicer word to describe him because he is the worst of the worst. Like for you to take your your dislike and your hate out on an infant, an infant who is left on your doorstep in a basket. This child has no way to protect himself. This child has no knowledge of anything that's going on in this world. And you treat him like garbage just because you're afraid of something you don't understand. That is like the worst kind of parent. And there is no excuse for that. Petunia, even though, yes, she is garbage as well, she at least had she had a history with her sister. She had a history with Snape. She had a history of these things that she wanted and couldn't have. And so you could kind of see where that animosity comes from and you can understand it even if you don't excuse it. But Vernon was just nasty to begin with. So there, there's like no excuse for the way that he treated um, not just Harry, but also the way that they treat their son. Like there's no discipline in Dudley. There's no compassion. There's no, um, he has no structure. And because of that, that also makes him a, a bad parent because you are setting your child up to fail because you are not giving him the tools that he needs to be a decent human being. I mean, even at the end in, in book seven, when Dudley comes to Harry and he says the things, hey, you're not so bad. I don't think you're a waste of space it has nothing to do with his parents. Thankfully, you know, we see that. Maybe Dudley has seen as he gets older, hey, this is not the way we're supposed to treat somebody. Well, that's, you know? that's usually what happens with, with kids. As they get older, they start to see the truth about their parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think he was starting to see the truth that Harry wasn't the problem. Yeah. You know, um, the other thing I wanted to say, like I said, I have a lot to say about Petunia. You can hear that tomorrow, <laughs> six o'clock, same room. <laughs> oh, that's right better. Um, how did it affect Harry? Because Vernon is the person that is his father figure. And because of, of how Vernon treated him, what does Harry do when he has the opportunity to have another father figure in someone like um, Albus Dumbledore in Sirius Black? He had, I believe, sort of an unhealthy relationship with Sirius because he couldn't see that Sirius didn't necessarily have, well, how many, the book series is a little different from the movie series. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very much so. Very much so. The book series saw Harry as James, and that's sort of how you treated him. And then there were times when Harry didn't do what James would have done. Sirius was a little bit hurt and upset or disappointed. Oh, I guess you're not James. You're not James. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think Harry attaching himself to Sirius in that way and to Dumbledore in the way that he did is a result of how he was treated by Vernon because any little bit of, of niceness from a father figure is going to make him attach to them so strongly and deeply where he can't see that there's something maybe not right about their relationship. I can't blame him for it, but that's just the result of how he was raised. Yeah. Also, it's like when you when you spend so much time with a father figure that doesn't show you what you need, you immediately try to find someone else to take the to actually give you the affection and the attention and yeah. the positive feedback that you need. So, if, if he, could, he could have found anybody, it's like the first per. It's just like when you say the first. Usually, the first person that you see, you latch on to. So it, it could have been anybody, but it just happened to be. Have to be Dumbledore, but it's but that's a, that's just hum, that's just natural human nature. It's like you try to find someone and cling to them if you're not finding something that you have at home. And I asked myself, why didn't he attach to Arthur? As I think he was attached to Arthur, but I think <laughs> I think the thing with Harry is Arthur was the first father figure. He, I mean, just the Weasleys in general was the first family unit, the first functional, healthy family unit that Harry had been exposed to. So I think he was attached to Arthur, but I think the thing that brought him closer to Dumbledore or to Sirius or even to Lupin is the connection they had to his own father. 
And I think maybe that was why yeah, he right. latched on to them, because these are people who knew his parents that could tell him, you know, personal, intimate stories about his parents. Molly didn't know his parents, you know, uh, Arthur didn't know his parents like they were all part of the Order of the Phoenix. But you don't hear about a lot of interactions with them and James and Lily. However, Sirius was the best friend. Remus was the best friend. Albus was the one who they they were working um, in the order for him. So also he was their teacher. I mean, you even kind of sort of see that connection with him and um, Slughorn in a in a small sense, not because he's looking at Slughorn as a father figure, but Slughorn has this connection to his mother that he never knew about. And so he's like, reaching for any pieces of um, connection to James and Lily. So yeah. I, I think that was more so why he latched on mm. to like the Albus and, and Sirius. And Sirius, of course, being his godfather, he's just like, oh, okay, so this is the person who should have been taking care of me all this time anyway, except for this little lie that landed him in Azkaban for 12 years. But um, Can I chime in about Arthur, Annika? Yeah. So I was going to say, Arthur is Ron's father, and Harry and Ron were good buddies immediately upon meeting, and mm-hmm. and stayed that way. There was a hiccup, of course, in the books, but there's. I think that Harry was very clear that Ron and his six siblings, whatever it was, mm-hmm. um, I think I, I can't prove it, but I feel like Harry knew that that Ron had as little of Arthur as you can when you have six older siblings, five older siblings. If you so it's like I almost think like Harry was respectful of Ron's relationship with his with Arthur, and by the time Arthur comes along and really becomes important, he's got Sirius and he's got Albus. But also, there's this really great moment where Sirius, I think it was Sirius. I know this happens in the book. I don't know if it's in the movie. Sirius says to Molly, "Harry's not your son," and Molly goes, "He's as good as." Mm-hmm. Right? And we know Arthur agrees. Right? Arthur proves that he agrees with Molly on that in many, many, many ways and many times. So yeah, it's it, like like Harry is surrounded by people who loved his parents and were ter- they, they it was horrible to them when William James were murdered, especially because they had a one year old that was there when they were murdered. So there were there were a lot of extended family people and, and adoptive parents of various different kinds. I do think Albus used that to his advantage. I think it was I think the relationship with Albus was like you guys described, but I think also Albus knew that and took advantage of. Yeah, we successfully. Yeah, we. I think we've done Albus in the father's panel before. Okay, so enough of the Harry Potter journey. Um, I'm going to open it to the panelists. So, Hanako, is there a particular father that you would like to discuss at this time? Where to choose? Uh, actually, you know what? Um, I'm going to go with King Viserys Targaryen from House of the Dragon. Um, and and King Viserys is a very interesting person to bring into this discussion because on the one hand, we know that he is a it, he was a man who who loves his daughter, Rhaenyra. He uh names her as heir after he fails to have a son, um, which was unheard of in, in the time that he was ruling, but also um First season of House of the Dragon, and then also if you read the book that the show is based on, you can see different instances of where he actually adored this child. He loved her, um, doted on her the way that most fathers do with their daughters. However, I feel that he also failed with Rhaenyra because you can't name your child your heir and then not teach her about how to run the kingdom if something should happen to you. And this is something that is very clearly evident in House of the Dragon season one. You know, there are instances where Rhaenyra is in the um, council room with when he's with his small council mm. and she's trying to give her opinion on certain things. Like she pays attention. He does teach her about the politics of the land and this is what we have to do and this is how we're supposed to do this. He tells her about the prophecy that was, um, you know, supposed to be about the, the child of, you know, fire and ice. And he gives her all of this important stuff. 
as information. But when it comes to allowing her to kind of submit her place as the heir, he doesn't, he doesn't follow through with that. So it's like when it comes time for her to be named heir, nobody is respectful of that decision because they're like, she's a girl. What does she know? Well, if her father had allowed her to, if he had allowed her to do the things that he would have let a male heir do, I think that a lot of the drama and a lot of the conflict that we see towards the end of this the the season would not have happened, even if um, Allison had kids, even when she had, you know, her two sons, there would not have been a question, and we wouldn't be dealing with siblings trying to kill each other and trying to tear the country apart because he didn't do his job as a father. Or let me say, he didn't do his he did his job as a father. He didn't do his job as king and as her, you know. Yeah, it just. <sighs> See, if. if I, and then I, we won't even talk about the way the, the way that he was fa he, he was father to Allison's kids. Yeah, that I was, was going to say, I'm, I'm more concerned with how he treat, how how he didn't do anything with Allison's children. Yeah. Because Aegon turned out to be a pretty terrible kid and Aemon is just I don't know what he is. He's mean. <laughs> That's all he is. But their father didn't show them any love or kindness. It seems he had no participation in their life whatsoever. And I think a, a lot of that when it comes to royalty, when it comes to those type of hierarchies, when you are forced to marry someone that you don't love in order to fulfill your duty, that it doesn't do anyone any good. It, it actually does more harm than good. They could have left him as a widower. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to bring somebody else into his bed. He didn't have to bring um, someone else into that, into that um, establishment. And, and it just, it made things worse because one, you're already feeling maybe, this is just my, my guess. Mm -hmm. You're already feeling guilty because not only did you pick another bride after the death of your wife, you picked your daughter's best friend because you don't want to be stuck with somebody else. And you were like, okay, if I have to marry somebody, I might as well marry somebody I know. And I kind of sort of like, and you know, like I can stand to be married to her, but he didn't have great love for Allison. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and I think if it had just been that, they could have existed okay. He probably could have learned to love the kids. But then you also have Otto Hightower, which is another trash father in the, the mm -hmm. House of the Dragon series. You have him whispering mm -hmm. behind your ear. And it just kind of, I, I think a lot of that just kind of made the series kind of push away. Oh, okay. I, I'm going to defend the series a little bit here. Okay. Okay. And I wish, <laughs> and I wish Lori was here to back me up because Lori is a history <laughs> person. So in monarchies or in, in, in the way that these things work, the, the heir is the one that's important. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is a spare. Mm -hmm. So he's not concerned about them because they don't really matter. Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra is the one that is important mm -hmm. because she, he, and he always brings that energy whenever he talks about her. She's my heir, no question about it. But he didn't do the work yeah, to that's, back that's, up yeah, no, that didn't. statement. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. That's we, that's he, he why did. we're having the dance however, of dragons now. Right, but however, he he is okay in how you treated the other sons and the other kids because they're not important. They're just there in case something happens to her. But see, again, that comes from percep uh, perspective because they weren't important to him, but to the rest of the country. That's your firstborn son. That should be the heir. And because mm. he didn't, he didn't do what he needed to do to to like firmly cement. Rhaenyra is my heir, and I'm gonna make sure that everyone knows that she's the heir, not just from pomp and circumstance, but you're letting her participate in the decision making. You're you're making her visible at your meetings. You're making it clear that you are training her to lead the rest of the kingdom should right. something I, happen I to you. And he, no, 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 I because agree. Agree. he had saying, 10 you years. Have to separate, you have to separate the 
the king from the father. As a king, he failed her as his chosen heir. As a father, I think it's fine. No. Because <laughs> as a father, and unfortunately because of him, and, and and anybody in here, correct me if I'm wrong, because of the fact that you are king and you have named this child your heir, it is your duty as a monarch and as a father to establish that her position is solid. Her position I, I is a fact. I understand what fact. you're saying, but and traditionally he, uh, uh, in monarchs, had, it doesn't, that is not being the parent is not important. You're right. Training her to be the heir, training her to be the next ruler is what's important. He failed at that. But as a father, he still loved her. He talked to her. He doted on her. He treated her like his daughter. Now, that may have been the problem. That may have been the mistake. I, was saying, I think I understand what you're saying. The parent, like, there's more to parenting than just loving and, like, dolling when your kids, like, you want to make them to and you need to protect her your your number one job as a parent is to protect your child yeah. and for you to put her in this position to say you are the heir you will be the ruler over this entire kingdom once i am gone and you see that for the next 10 years, your body is falling apart. You know you are not about to live until old age. Right. So it is his job as a father to make sure, especially once you have, right, especially once you see she's having these children that, that don't look like yeah. they're her husband's children. You know that she's going to need extra, extra protection for this. And granted, he came through for her in the end for yeah. that but why did it even need to get to that point you left things open for her for the validity of her um succession to be challenged over and over yes. and over again and as a father you did not do what you were supposed to do to protect your child no his failure was as a monarch his failure was he didn't separate being her father from being her king we have watched shows before, especially um, what was the the King Arthur show we watched, Cursed, yeah, mm -hmm. where um, Uther referred to himself as the Crown because he was the Crown. He didn't refer to himself as me or I. The Crown recognized you. The Crown must be treated a certain way because in monarchs, being the monarch is separate from being an individual. Mm -hmm. So being King Viserys is separate from being Daddy Viserys. I'm saying we don't really have enough evidence that he was a bad father. We have a lot of evidence that he was a terrible monarch. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if, if he was bad as a king, if you were king, you don't get that father. You really have to be other people. Just that over. I don't know how to separate it's just like when we take, if you're a teacher, and I'm trying to teach my own child, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, I can't separate being a mom and a teacher when I have a red hair. I'm trying to work on math. I have to teach with it here. So, bad parent. But if you want to separate it, he still was a bad parent because he treated his other kids wrong only because he treated the first daughter right because you were in love with the mom. So I really did say that he treated mom, his other kids. He didn't treat him like yes, he did. So he's a bad parent anyway. He's not supposed to have favoritism. Listen to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> you can no longer come to <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's Thank move on. There's a hand in the back. Okay. Kind of going right. that round. Um, Mike, who do you All want right. to talk about? Okay, so I have I have a couple. The first one is real quick because I'm going to talk more about it at 6 o'clock tomorrow. Same room. Um, first is any parent that allowed their child to be injected with compound V in the boys is a trash parent. Yeah. How dare you try to try to make money off your child at a young age by giving them superpowers that might or might not work that might give them some kind of other power is terrible. I have a specific example tomorrow, but I just think that if you do that to your to your child, you're a trash parent. My main one is okay. Show of hands, who is who watches Full Metal Alchemist? 
then you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Somebody went, ah. <laughs> he <laughs> said someone's going to say, ah. He did. I told you. I he, told he you. That. Yeah. I want to talk about Show Tucker. He is a, he is a, he was a state certified alchemist who turned his daughter and the pet dog into a chimera. Merged them together. Oh. Oh. He did such a bad job that she begged for death at every chance that she could. And her brother almost killed their father before he turned him in. But it's this, this thing, this show Tucker has traumatized a generation so bad that they cannot hear the word Edward without breaking down into tears and running away. There was, I actually saw somebody, if you see anybody around here dressed with like blonde, long blonde hair that looks like a dog and they sit down, there'll be people, little people, People will literally run away from that person because of this show Tucker. Oh. Okay, I'll put I'll, I'll put in for the older people. Remember Never Ending Story, the horse. Oh no, no, no! no. It's worse. No. It's worse. Oh, my God. No. It's worse. The, the reaction that you get people, that people get for Show Tucker is worse than that. And it's like I I watch I watched I watched the episode. I was just like, Damn. yeah, he's 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 mad trash. The first chimera he made was with his wife and the dog. He used to get to get a license to be a state alchemist. So oh, why? Because he wanted to be a state Sam. alchemist. But it's like he, then he couldn't he couldn't have he couldn't have any more a lot more success. Like everything else he made after that was trash. So he was about to lose his license. So he had to figure out something to do, and he so he merged his daughter Nina and the dog, and it's. It's literally one of the most traumatizing things that the younger generation has seen. And like it's terrible. Wow. Oh. Okay, I think Mike won. I cannot believe you went to, I cannot believe you went to train. I mean, am I, I mean, am I right? Right. <laughs> right. Sounds not wrong. Like like I'm sitting I'm sitting here going, wait, this person didn't have access to homeless people like a Bond villain? <laughs> he probably did, but they but they didn't get it. It's just it is but it's I love you guys. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's one one of the most like sad and tragic and traumatizing wow. things. <laughs> I, I I don't know what to go. I don't I don't know how to follow that up. I mean, like, what do you? We, we're talking about trash parents. That's a tr as a trash <laughs> album. <laughs> what it's really good. It's a really good anime. It's an outstanding. Well, I've anime. heard. I've heard. The, the fans are like intense. Yeah. But that moment is just like if they if they even see a long long haired blonde dog, they'll run the entire opposite direction. Oh my god! Literally. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Mike. Um, any any comments from the audience? Anyone? Okay. Wait. I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't mean to bring the room down. You go last. <laughs> I do not want to follow that. <laughs> no, <dude. laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> and if somebody gave a father you know what? Somebody else is stealing it from him. Immediately. It's like, no, you don't deserve this. Rescinded. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, Darren. I, I don't know how you're going to do that. So. so, what I'd like to do first is give a whole room a big hug. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So we've, we've done this panel a couple times. I love doing this, these topics because, like, we never run out of stuff to talk about. Never. Right. Like, it starts from Darth Vader, but it goes everywhere, all over the place. So I was recently looking for uh, an audio book to fill some space while I was doing some, some work, and I turned, I put Frankenstein back on. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I love this book. I've, li I've listened to it about 12 times. One of my favorites. If you have not read or listened to the audio book, The Unabridged, Audiobook of the original Frankenstein, you are wrong. Um, <laughs> she invented a whole bunch of stuff that we take for granted now, especially in the science fiction and horror genres. Mm -hmm. um, this is a novel um, that is incredibly, it's over 200 years old now, I think. This novel is basically um, a treatise on taking care of your children. Right. Victor Frankenstein is one of the worst dads ever, in my opinion, because he made a son, and then three seconds after meeting his son, he went, ah, and fled, and then his son started murdering people, because, you know, if you, if you were one day old, 
but you had the, an eight foot body that was incredibly super strong and powerful and everything, and you decided you wanted to have a temper tantrum. Then I think the temper tantrums in the original book are actually kind of mild considering what they choose to pull up. Yes. That this, this is a comedy, but it's also this is the first Frankenstein movie where Dr. Frankenstein takes responsibility for mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the Mel Brooks Young Frankenstein version of the story is obviously the, it's a parody and it's, it's supposed to be a comedy and it's farce. So, like, the whole tap dancing thing is not part of the original story, but it's the, not, it's no, it's I'm sorry, there's no, no, <laughs> wow, that, that song hadn't been written yet for one thing. The, um, but but you're absolutely right. Is that Gene Wilder's son of Victor Frankenstein, who rejected his father's craziness? Um, he actually went through the whole. The, he went through the same process out of scientific curiosity, and you know, he's a little bit of a mad scientist, but not that much. And so he went back, and then he did it, and he went, "Okay, I have to go take care of this creation that I've made." That is so not Victor Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Victor was Victor was a jerk to his creation and abandoning him instantly. And it was, this is the weird thing, I'm going back, like I said, I'm reading it again. It took two years for the monster to catch up with his dad, right? Jeez. So the, what most of, most of the second fifth of the book is, is the monster telling his dad what he's been doing while he was away and how he figured out all these things on his own, which is amazing. Right? And it's like I said, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's amazing. It's so brilliantly done, so brilliantly constructed. The writing is amazing. The storytelling is incredible. But the whole time I'm listening to this thing, I'm going, oh my God, Victor, you suck as bad. Um, he basically didn't tell anybody that he knew what was going on when, when the monster started murdering people in the family. Victor didn't tell anybody anything. It took him, I think, a couple of years to admit anything to anybody, and by then it was really too late. Um, he took no personal responsibility at all. There's, there's, there's almost nothing in the book until the very end of the story. There's really nothing in the book where, where Victor says to himself, this is all me. I need to fix this. Let me go figure out how to fix this. Um, he basically stands around and goes, well, I made him, but, you know, which is just lame. Yes. Have y'all talked, I'm sorry, have y'all talked fathers in the, um, I just finished the game of Thrones watching it. Y'all talk about fathers like in the game of We, we just no, we literally anyway. just talked about King Viserys. He's my favorite. We'll 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 come back to that. You stick your pen in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll circle. We'll, 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 we'll circle. circle. We'll circle. But also, there's always next year. We'll circle back. Also, also, anybody with me on the You were, I, you, you yeah, know, I'm talking. Well, okay. So, I was, I was, oh. I'm sorry. Real quick, I was just gonna say, you know how people always say. Zelda, like they, they see Link and they say, Oh, that's Zelda. Like, you're not, no, Zelda's not yeah. Link. Like, and people always say that Frankenstein is the monster. Like, no, they're actually referring to the doctor, but really, he is a monster, mm -hmm. technically. Mm -hmm. Like, when you think about it, oh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, because yeah. Victor is really the monster, yeah, right? He created something monstrous, but like, what one of the things we love debating is what, what actually makes something a monster. And, and okay, so one of my favorite bits of trivia of all time is that. Uh, is that the monster refers to himself as Adam. So if anybody ever says to you, the monster has no name, you can go, ha ha, his name is Adam. Um, but Adam is trying to be not, in fact, he, he spends that first year of his existence secretly helping out a poor family with the blind grandfather and everything. He kind of sneaks off into the woods and cuts firewood for them so they can do other things because he loves them and he thinks they're great. So yeah, Victor, the doctor who made him is the real monster. Yeah. Hmm. And and you said something very important that that he created him and then left him to his own devices. Right. And it it I don't want to compare the two, but um, Dumbledore did the same thing with Harry. He just kind of left him out there, and you can't really be upset with how he is based on how he was raised when he, there was probably other opportunities. Or better situations. I, okay, if, if if Dumbledore had made the monster, I think he would have like made sure he landed somewhere where people would 
take care of, at least take care of him superficially, right? Mm -hmm. Food and water and shelter, right? I mean, that's that's basically what he did that's with Harry, thing, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. that's what I'm saying. He, yeah. he sent him to the Dursleys, even even knowing that the Dursleys would treat him wrong, but it was still a way to keep him safe and not exposed. But that's, don't, we yeah. could and, do and like a whole panel. Yeah. And surprisingly, on, he didn't turn into a monster, you know. With yeah. the way that the Dursleys treated him. The way that he him. was treated. Yeah. You I, know, circling back to Frankenstein's mm -hmm. monster, it's the same thing. He his situation created created the monster. Like he is, I don't know. I, I mean, he's he's he spends like five five chapters of the of the book just being a puppy. Yeah, he just wants to be pet. He just wants to be loved. He wants to be part of this family. And they they hit him with sticks, literally. Yeah, and he's like, well, fine. I'm gonna piggyback off of what you're saying um, as far as Victor Frankenstein. Um, are any of you familiar with Penny Dreadful? The TV show. Oh, you guys need to remedy that like quickly. <laughs> but there is <laughs> so Penny Dreadful is um, an old kind of like gothic type of TV show, and they do have characters from various literature yeah, it's, stories. It's and you it's do so have good. Victor Frankenstein there, and you do have the creation of Frankenstein's monster. And he does in the show the same thing that he does in the book where he creates this, this being and he's so repulsed by it that he abandons it. And this, this being who was once a dead person and is now reanimated, he has to figure out what he is and how he fits into this life that he technically is not supposed to be a part of again. And as a, a, a person who was alive, this man had a wife and a child. So now as this reanimated person, you're you're trying to figure out if you can fit back in with this family. And because he can't, he does the equivalent of what the book Victor Frankenstein does as far as taking care of the family. He he's trying to help his wife and child from afar. And it's just the the actor who portrayed that character. It's one of the greatest character performances I have ever seen on TV. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things where, again, we're always taught that Frankenstein is the monster when in reality he is not. And if you watch this portrayal on Penny Dreadful, it will change your mind or it will at least make you look at things with a different lens and see the way that Victor Frankenstein, because he was trying to do it because he wanted to do something great. He wanted to change the world. He wanted to basically elevate himself. And the things that he does, and, and we see this with real life too, the things that people do in the name of science, in the name of glory, in the name of trying to elevate who they are and what they do and put their name and lights and all for ego. And the things that you do to do that, you don't think about the consequences of your actions. And when you read the story of Victor Frankenstein and when you watch this portrayal of it in Penny Dreadful, it will be so crystal clear who the monster is and who the monster isn't. And it's like, it's a beautiful portrayal. I'm, I'm telling you, if you're able to find it, that show is only like, I think, three or four seasons. It's like one of the best shows ever. Um, I think this was maybe 12 or 13. Netflix? Yeah. Yes, Netflix. I um, think it might be on Netflix. Be. That's where I watched Mike, it. Mike, I watched write, it. Write this down. Panel idea. What makes a monster a monster? <laughs> gotcha. Oh, yeah. That's a fun one. That's yeah. a fun one. Yeah. Um, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Have you ever watched the musical? That, that is one of the The questions. Disney one? I wouldn't necessarily recommend the Disney one, okay, but yeah, if you could see the... What was, the, what was the name of the Cardinal Bishop? What was his name? Fro 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 like, yes. Yeah, let, Fro let's, Fro let's compare him to Dumbledore. Why Dumbledore? Fro 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 was a terrible father. We can't do Dumbledore <laughs> in, in the time that we have left. That has to be a whole different Wait, I gotta watch the last three Harry Potter movies still. Do I need to oh, leave? Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we're not going to get into it. We're not going to get into it. I'll say that's what I watched was, I think, the Order of the Phoenix was back. Oh. Oh. Well, yeah, it's, it's been it's been a minute. I think the statute of limitations is up this past on Harry Potter. Yeah. Are, are we good on, on, on Victor? Are we good? Anybody else want to? Anyone else want to chime in on, on Victor? 
Okay, I'll give okay. you homework for next year. All right. All right. Okay. So at this time, I want to open it up to anyone in the audience who would like to discuss a Abraham. Okay. Where do I start? Since I like supernatural, come on, talk about the one and only John Winchester. <sighs> In this flashback, <laughs> you find out it's a, a piece of a whore who would go on hunt and leave his oldest kid to take care of his baby brother and wouldn't be, would be gone for like weeks at a time. If anything really bad happens, go to this preacher who we know. And I'm like, you don't just leave, even back then, a pair of leaves their kid in a motel, in a crappy motel room. But only any food. And it affected the kids, the brothers. Later on, you can totally tell. Yeah, a little. That Dean becomes an alcoholic because of it. Just on the good. So. Okay. This is this is her wheelhouse. Annika, can I go real quick? Let her cook. Yes, Let her cook. And, then and then I'll get out of your way. Sure. Annika okay. only backed me on this panel four years ago because she wanted to talk about John. Yeah. Yeah. We we've we've talked John Winchester extensively with this uh, panel, but yeah, Darren, okay. go ahead. As a dad, I want to defend Winchester a little bit. Okay. And Coco throw a chair at me if you want, if she wants. No, because I've got defense for him oh, too. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. so we might we might agree on it this this time. Um, Okay, so one of the things you do as a father is uh, is you you're in charge of protecting the family, right? This is old school biological Protect stuff. Protect and prevent. Exactly. No, it solves problems, right? You're, you're the one that, that puts things back together after mom soothes the fact that everything is broken, right? Just, just the way we're wired. <laughs> the way we're wired. It's old school stuff. So as a father, it is my job to turn to my small child and go, there are no monsters under the bed. Go to sleep. There are monsters under the Winchester's beds, literally. What the heck was he supposed to do? Like, I can I understand, I can understand, like, asking John Winchester to stop being a hunter just because he happens to have a couple of kids and his wife just happened to have been murdered by a monster set on fire and put on the ceiling. It's like, it's, it's like, like I, there were times, but like, on the show, like, I agree with that, but like, at the same time, I'm like, he could have left him with, like, with someone in the family or somebody. Yeah. Okay, okay, but here okay, but here's the thing. Yeah. Okay. So so let's talk about let's talk about John Winchester. So you're John Winchester. You have two young children and you are a widow now because a demon of Satan killed your wife. Like you do. Who would you leave your children with knowing that they are possible targets, especially once you find out that Mary Winchester was killed because she made yes. a she made a deal years before Sam was born that th that this demon could have Sam. OK, <gasps> when you wait, you've never seen it. I know. I know. The so, right. So here's the thing. You have you have a demon coming after your child, and you know this demon is coming after your children. Would you really, as a person who has family, would you leave your children with anybody else, knowing that any time these people can be murdered for your children? If anybody if anything, John Winchester from, from a very young age with Sam and Dean taught them like, like they say in the first episode, Sam says, you know, when I was, when I was young, dad told me there were monsters under the bed and Dean is like, what was he supposed to do? Tell me there's not monsters. And Dean was like, but you know, the monsters exist. Yeah. Okay. So as a father, we just talked about this with King Viserys. It is your job to protect your children. It is your job to teach your children what they need to do to survive, especially if they come up in a world where monsters exist. OK, John Winchester, we have to remember that at the time that Mary died, John did not remember anything about being a hunter. He did not know anything about his wife being a hunter. This is stuff that we find out through flashbacks over 15 seasons and a spinoff show. OK, as a parent. You do what you're supposed to do to protect your children. His children knew what to do to protect themselves against a whole variety they, they gave of monsters. Them the tools to do what they're supposed right. to do. Right. So here's the thing. 
Yeah. He had his moments. And yes, <laughs> maybe the methods that we look at him through and the lens we look at him through, it looks abusive. It looks toxic. Okay. We are Gen X up here. We grew up from a whole with a whole different set of rules than the kids these days. A lot of the things that our parents did to us and, and the way that they raised us, kids these days look at it as toxic. They look at it as abusive and all this other stuff. But we did also did not deal with a lot of the stuff that the kids in this generation deal with because of the way that we were raised. In the same sense <clears throat> with Sam and Dean, they have the tools to survive. Yeah, John may have left them in a hotel room for days on end, weeks on end while he went to go hunt these things. But he is doing, and, and again, this is a hindsight because we don't find this out until the second season. John finds out what the deal is, why Mary died. You have to protect Sam. You know what I'm saying? Sam, you're trying, you're, you're, you're trying to raise this, this little kid. You're trying to make sure that nobody comes after him. Who is going to protect Sam better than anybody better than John himself? Dean motherfucking Winchester. He is not going to let nobody touch his baby brother. Oh. So in, in that sense, you are doing the best thing for your children. Now, his methods could have been a little more polished. His methods could have been a little more kind. But I also feel like if John Winchester did anything different than the way that he did things, those two would not have become the men that they became in order to save the world several times, several times. They would not have been able to save the people that they saved. And as much as it hurts to look at the way their relationship was, even as they get older, they start to understand dad did the best he could. And even though it wasn't perfect, it taught us what we needed to teach. Uh, it, you know, it, it taught us what we needed to learn. It kept us alive. It helped us save people. And it also taught us what was important. And help him save the world. Several times. Several so like times. I said, I would defend John Winchester all day long. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we had a hand over here. However, um, it's about it's a cartoon yeah. about a boy who uh, spent his entire most of his life thinking that he was when he finally finds out that his father is actually alive. Um, the very first time that he uh, meets him, he breaks him out of um, eternal prison. Um, instantly takes advantage of him to um, escape and escape with a bunch of different criminals. Which ultimately led into um, been trying to reach his father, his father trying to escape and him actually moving on. Throughout the series, um, Ben tries to create this connection with his father that he's wanted his entire 14 years of life. Mm -hmm. And the father constantly takes advantage of that as a con man and spins it until he gets what he wants and then he gets it. Um, Finds out eventually, you know, that there are other people that are around, and um, that his father um, was actually with him when he left the island. So, um, no matter how hard that Finn tried to create an, an established connection as only humans that he knew of, his father just constantly took advantage. He didn't even bother remembering his name. Uh, I think the episode that they. Had yeah, some fathers are just trash. Yeah. Just <laughs> but but it didn't change. It didn't. Did it affect Finn a certain way? Like, did it make him, you know, bitter, or did he just keep trying? Like, was he always hopeful? Was he like Luke? Like, there's a good good side of him, you know? Oh, did I pick up the Skywalkers again? Uh. At the very um, when he first found out about his father and he lost his arm, he goes through this whole episode where he is so angry that. He Father's arm. So he builds this tower to try to get into space to reach where his father is. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I did not know Adventure Time had all that going on. I was yeah, like, I was 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 like, I was
why the kid charged me so I I I I I do do that part. But also, uh, if you if you looked at the first episode of Star Wars Rebels and you're like, yeah, that's for kids. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. No, it, it got it, it Harry Potter on us. Yes. Uh -huh. it, went, it went like this with the thematic maturity very quickly. There's a lot of familial relationship stuff in Star Wars Rebels from the very beginning all the way to the very very end, and actually beyond into Ahsoka. So yeah, the the idea that the parents influence what's going on, yeah, it is. yeah, absolutely, and it's it's everywhere. What I love is uh, Harry Potter, Star Wars Rebels. There's a whole bunch of these things where it starts off being something to get the kids interested. By the time you get to the end, you're like, "Well, that was deep, man. That was heavy." Oh. <laughs> well, usually we talk about these things where where the the audience grows with the show. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, like Percy Jackson, if you watch this first season, um, it seems very sanitized. It skews very young, but you know, if they're planning on going several seasons, it's going to mature yeah. with this with this. Yeah. yeah as the, because that yeah. happened with Clone Wars, that happened with Star Wars Rebels. The kids start watching it at eight, but by the time it ends, they're like 13, 14, mm -hmm. 15. So it has to age with the kids. All right, we got like three minutes for Have y'all seen the new cover? Yes. No. Okay, so for the first Are you talking about Mr.? Yeah, his dad, which is the way that he is, the way he is, since we're talking about Yeah. How do you feel about in the new color purple? Dee basically, in the first one she did, she was like, fuck you. Go to hell, and then she left on all about her business. She was never yeah. his friend. And the second one, that was the only thing I didn't like that she basically just forgave him for everything. All of a sudden, get the done with them and everything. I said him and his raggedy ass then. So. <laughs> I don't think that she forgave him in that sense. And this is something we're we're actually about to do. We're about to do a panel on Negan and talk about redemption arcs. So uh at eight o'clock. But so so the thing with So the thing with Mr. is I don't think that she forgave him in that sense, but when you look at the new purple, uh, excuse me, color purple, Seely's life got better once she left him. Oh, it and it's like, and once you it. see where another person is, especially once you're gone and you see that they really, that there's really nothing left to them once you have left, it gives you a different perspective. And I say this, I mean, um, I, I know there are several, there are several people in here who are divorced. When you leave that type of relationship, when you leave that type of toxicity and you see what that person is without you and how far they have fallen, you really don't have room in your heart at that point for hate or for animosity. At least I, I, I really feel like she was looking at it as this is a this is a small man. OK. This is a man who was also raised by a small man. And a lot of times we can't, I don't want to say we can't blame people for how they were brought up, but it's like if you were raised a certain way, you're only going to behave in that certain way until yeah. you <clears throat> learn better to do better. And I think the way that they wrote Mr. Yeah. But you don't have to be his friend. No, I, but here's the, here's the thing. You have to be a big person in order to be able to forgive somebody who's done that kind of wrong to you. Why he got to be at the dinner? Why not? Oh. You you show a person grace because here's the thing: if you treat if you treat negative with negative, you're going to continue to produce negative. But it's just he don't even exist, right? But it doesn't change. That's not who you are. Right. You're the person. And you can make that person better by showing them a little bit of grace. Even and I really feel like that's kind of sort of where that story was going. Even at the end of the first one, she ended up. But you got to think about also the time frame that that was in. That that's kind of how how it, was. how it was. I mean, marriages back then were transactional. But yeah, so that raggedy he was living before she came in. Well, I mean, that's, okay, we, we're going to stick a pin in it. We will probably be back next year. With this always next year. We'll be back with this panel you see, next year. No, 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 no. Harpo had a Harpo had a wife that didn't put up with that. 
It's like but, he, he ended up looking like he got kicked in the face up. with a mule. Because he didn't never want to do it anyway. That's why his daddy would always be like enforcing it like, no, yeah. this is what you have. Oh, okay. okay. That's we're a whole like, different conversation. Yeah, we're we're going to go yeah. ahead and wrap it up. I'm going right. to <laughs> uh, uh, tell us where, tell the audience where they can find you. Um, we'll start with Hanukkah this time. Um, you can find me at the Fandom Hybrid Podcast Ooh. at Fandom Hybrid. We are on all the social medias. You can find us on YouTube as well. I would suggest, highly suggest the YouTube because you can see our facial expressions and it makes the podcast way funny. Um, also, this weekend here at uh, here at Atlanta Comic Con, <laughs> we will be doing four other panels. Um, as I stated, we will be in three fourteen. Um, tonight at eight o'clock talking about Negan from The Walking Dead. We will be in that room tomorrow talking about Maggie Ree and whether or not what she that's that's at eight uh, that's at eight o'clock uh, tomorrow night as well. And then on Sunday at two o'clock in that room, we will be discussing the Daryl Dixon show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and tomorrow you are welcome. At six. I had like an hour and a half. Well, yeah. yeah. Um Mike. Um, you okay. can also you can also find me on the Fandom Hybrid podcast, um, espousing theories and telling bad jokes. And you really have to see the YouTube and watch your eyes roll every time I say something. <laughs> um, you can you can also find me on TikTok at e m c e e one three seven one, and any any other socials you have, probably. I am not part of the Fandom Hybrid podcast, but we love, we you, love you anyway. You <laughs> it wasn't a judgment thing; it was, it was a hint, actually. More than no. My name is still Darren Bush. You can find my uh, author's page on Amazon. I got some short stories up there for your various ebook formats. Also, my YouTube channel is called Tables of Content. I've got a QR code up here if anybody's interested. Um, and I will be at Con Possible, which is a steampunk alternate history convention next weekend here in Atlanta. And then I have like eight more conventions this year and things. So, and tomorrow in this room, 6 p.m., mothers take it their turn. And again, I'm Anthony Liggins. You can find me at the Phantom Hybrid Podcast as well. Thank you guys for coming. Um, great discussion. I'm always amazed. You know, Hanukkah and I have this discussion. She's like, we talk about the same people. You need to add some new people. You need to keep it fresh. The discussion is different every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every time. And, and I think it's amazing. And that's why we're going to keep it. And I'm going to keep talking about Bruce Wayne because I believe he is the absolute worst <laughs> yeah. father of them all. all right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Y'all are about to be disgusting. Thank you, thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.